I think it's been super awesome. So we have one more performer. I said early on, just kind of an improv joke off the top of my head, that it would get sad as we got later on, but it hasn't gotten sad. It's all been still amazing. And while it is sad that we have one more performer, it's going to be awesome. And this performer is Marlene Hover, who is a, who is a long time uh, queer, kink, trans, sex positive, feminist, social justice activist, and is currently director of collections at the archive of the Center for Sex and Culture. So please welcome up, Marlene. about someone telling a story about something someone else once said. <laughs> and sometimes people think I'm younger than I am, so I'll clarify this telling stories about telling stories is postmodern, not meta. <laughs> shaking apart presumptions about how identities are structured, and she asks her audience, what if I strapped on a dildo and fuck you? Then what would I be? And Carol Queen pipes up with, nostalgic. <laughs> <laughs> I giggled the first time I heard that, and then I should have kept grinning for about an hour. I put together everything I knew from reading about these people I didn't know, I knew that Carol was a kinky dyke who played with fags. I had read what would become the first chapter of The Leather Daddy and the Famine Taste of Latex. I knew Carol was part of the same push towards a new queer revolution that I was part of. Reading these words, I knew that Carol and Kate were fond of each other. I knew that there was a friendship in the world that was like the friendships I would need. A queer trans woman, the only trans woman who had ever written a book that talked about her queerness had a friendship with a queer cis woman. That made me feel a little safer. That made me feel like I was going to be okay. I was alone in my room in a new city where I had lived just a few months. The copy of Gender Outlaw was borrowed from a friend. Within weeks, I would be paying a trans woman with an MFCC to write me a hormone letter. I think it was 40 bucks, and that included a half hour conversation in a coffee shop on Haight Street about which hormones did what, and she gave me the name of the friendly local endocrinologist who looked and talked a lot like Dr. Bruce Westheimer. <laughs> <laughs> I have to ask, am I the only person in the room who's a survivor of the Smilo cocktail? <clears throat> okay. <laughs> I feel old. Uh, it consisted of a slightly high dose of preparin, a slightly high dose of astinil, that's two different kinds of estrogen, either of which would be plenty on their own, and Provera, which was a progesterone that made me want to have a baby. <laughs> I got a job as a messenger. I couldn't pass and had almost no luck finding work. Delivering other people's legal papers and enormous checks kept me fat. I worked for one of the big messenger companies. I would rather have worked for Lickety Split, the dyke messenger company, but I wasn't welcome. <coughs> the girls who wrote for Lickety Split wouldn't even talk to me when we met on the street. A dyke I knew took me out to see a performance. It was at Theater Rhinoceros or some other incarnation of some other space somewhere in that building at some point. <laughs> it was a women-only event. My friend introduced me to a friend of hers who made compliments about my appearance with the finest of butch manners, and I was petrified, and I didn't know if I was being made fun of. And I don't think I said anything. After the performance, some dyke with a mullet said I shouldn't be there. Uh, but who I still see around town 
told her she was mistaken. And a small fight ensued. <laughs> Mullet took off, but I was too uncomfortable. <laughs> Except the invitation to the bar with everybody else. When I first read the beginnings of The Leather Daddy and the Femme, I was living as a fag in a relationship with a guy. Transition wasn't my introduction to queer women's community. My partner's friends were my friends, and I knew the culture and social norms about as well as any other world I had lived in. I went to a support group for trans women. They were all in their 40s and straight, and they had jobs downtown and they wore polyester skirt suits. <laughs> I didn't go back. I had a friend named Casey, another trans woman who was a little too butch for the trans women support groups. She also had a motorcycle. She was also serious about her king. We didn't hang out much except at the waiting room at Tom Waddell, but we would see each other around town every now and then, and that was important to both of us. There was another one like us, but she was older and not very friendly, but it was good to know she existed too. Casey died in her sleep. I went to a meeting of FTM International in my capacity as a dildo maker. <laughs> I asked the guys what they wanted and took their thoughts back with me to influence future designs. <laughs> I made a few friends. I met boys who had just been kinky punk rock 20 something dykes like I was becoming. And they were becoming kinky punk rock 20 something faggots like I had just been. <laughs> they gave me the lowdown on what pieces of the local dyke community I shouldn't bother with, and we used brand new words together like non operative transsexual. I also learned what it feels like to be a girl with a crush on a faggot who really doesn't do girls. <laughs> I haven't spoken with my mother in years, but I'm the woman she raised on children's stories published in Ms. Magazine. She taught me to question what the male-dominated medical establishment tells us about what our bodies are and what our bodies mean. I don't think she has any idea how useful that was. <laughs> Some things are pretty much the same now as they were when I started to transition, but most things are really different. At the first girl talk, Julia talked about the greatest barrier to trans women's participation in queer women's space. She called for the destruction of the insider-outsider myth, and coincidentally, when Julia mentioned that she printed a copy of what she presented here in 2009, that's what I'm referring to. The myth that trans women were aliens to queer women's spaces. In fact, we've been there, been here, for a very long time. I knew she was right because I know the reason I'm no longer anxious in these spaces is that I've been here long enough that I can't be intimidated out. I'm no longer very good at picking up on those things that might make trans women uncomfortable. The girl taking money at the door who might make me feel unwelcome. My Exiles membership lapsed because I was too lazy to cross the bridge from Oakland before that girl ever saw two girls kiss. <laughs> Women, <laughs> with the occasional less than warm welcome from the queer women's community, I got the welcome I really needed. I met a much older trans man who was just starting transition. He had lived as a butch dyke as far back as the 50s. We talked about the ways new and old of our shared world of queer women. We only had a few conversations. But one night, I came home to a letter from him. It's actually
actually turned yellow. <laughs> 19 February, 95. Dear Marlene, last time we talked, you mentioned that you need $1,500 for electrolysis. I wonder if you would permit me to give it to you. This is not a loan, but a gift. I sold my old apartment at a slight profit in October, so this is a sum I can spare. It was an unexpected windfall. When I was young, my older friends kept me afloat for years by various kindnesses, and I feel the need to pass it along. Please take and enjoy. 